My wife has a friend who lives in another state who every once in a while calls me instead of her. Uh, this friend of my wife uh, reads her Bible, goes to church, and starts having questions. So what she does is she writes all these questions down, and about every six months, she calls me with this long list of questions, which is uh, actually quite enjoyable. We have long conversations, and they're rather interesting, to say the least. At any rate, in one of these conversations, she said to me, uh, I've been reading the Old Testament. Why does that apply to me? It doesn't apply to me at all. How do I apply the Old Testament to me? Now, she had something in mind pertaining to the Mosaic Law, but um, I thought that's a good question. And, and currently, we've been studying the book of Proverbs, and there's a subject in the book of Proverbs, and I thought to myself, how in the world do we apply that? There are a number of verses in the book of Proverbs that address a king. Now, <laughs> I'm committed to expounding all the topics in Proverbs, so I have to deal with this, and there are a lot of verses on it, but how do, I mean, I don't have kings come to my church. And beyond that, even if I went try to find some, where would I go? I don't think we have kings in America. I think we'd go to England, and then I'd find one, right? So how do you apply all those verses pertaining to kings in the book of Proverbs? Well, as I laid it out, I discovered there's a lot of application to what the Bible has to say to kings. In the first place, I think it would be legitimate to apply king to anyone who has authority. Uh, anyone in a position of authority could be a parent, a teacher. Uh, in a church, elders are clearly said to rule, which would be the idea. And beyond that, how about what happens at work? You have a boss. Uh, and even politically, at a number of levels, there are politicians that we would consider rulers. A judge could be considered a ruler in the biblical sense of the term. So I think there's a lot of application at numerous levels. But as I looked at all of these, it got even more interesting. So here's what I'd like to do. Three things. Number one, I'd like to describe what the book of Proverbs says about a wise ruler. It talks about kings. It's in the book of Proverbs. The subject is wisdom. And so obviously, in the good sense, these are wise rulers. Then I'd like to do a second thing. There are a couple of Proverbs that get at the essence of being a ruler, the definitive quality that makes a ruler a ruler. And thirdly, I, there are a number of Proverbs that talk about how to deal with a ruler. So instead of the word king, I'm going to use the word ruler. And I mean for this to apply to anyone who has authority in some sense of the term. So with that in mind, would you turn with me to the book of Proverbs? And let's begin by looking at a description of a wise ruler. First, look at Proverbs 21, verse 1. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, like the rivers of water. He turns it wherever he wishes. Now, what I can glean from this proverb is that rulers have a ruler that they aren't the final authority no matter how much power they have. In the ancient world, the king had almost absolute power, and yet this proverb says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. So a wise ruler is aware that the Lord is the ultimate authority. It says it's in the hand of the Lord like the rivers of water. Now, in the ancient world, they had... Uh, little rivers, and what farmers would do is they would cut off little streams so they could water their crops. And the idea was that those little rivers of water controlled the water, 
And the point of this is the Lord, uh, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord and he controls it like the little channels control the water. There are a number of illustrations of that in the scripture. Uh, the Lord moved, turned the heart of Pharaoh toward Joseph. Uh, the Babylonian officers gave some grace to the Daniel and the three Hebrew children. Nehemiah sought the God of heaven to give him favor to do what he felt needed to be done. At any rate, the point is, no matter what you rule, no matter how much authority you have, the Lord is the ultimate decider. Proverbs 29, 26 says something similar. Many seek the ruler's favor, but the justice for man comes from the Lord. It is not the ruler who finally decides the fate of people. It is the Lord. The next characteristic, I would say, of a wise ruler is that if he's really wise, he makes decisions based on the word. Proverbs 16.10 says, Divination is on the lips of the king. His mouth must not transgress in judgment. Now, when you see the word divination in the scripture, it usually is talking about witchcraft. But it can be used in a positive sense of simply an oracle. And in here, it's in that good sense of God gave his word and kings speak that word. As a matter of fact, this is specifically taught in Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy 17, 18 through 20 says, uh, kings are to speak in line with the law. So that when God's law is his law, a divine sentence is on his lips. Now, I think any ruler at any level needs to be aware of what God says in his word. Whether that is parents at home or a boss at work or at any, every level in political government that Wisdom comes from the word, and a good ruler is aware of that. Now, those are two very general things. A wise ruler is aware that the Lord is in control, and a wise ruler pays attention to what God says in his word. Now, what I want to do, there are a number of Proverbs, a lot of them, that I think give specific characteristics of a wise ruler. I'm going to mention five. If you walk out of this with five words tattooed in your brain, I will have considered this a successful exercise. The first is righteousness. And there are a lot of proverbs pertaining to righteousness in the life of a king. For example, Proverbs 16, 13 says, righteous lips are the delight of kings, and they love him who speaks what is right. Good rulers want people to tell them what is right. They love such advisors if they are wise. So this verse is saying, uh, righteous lips are a delight to those who are in some position of authority. I think on a personal level, we should... Uh, be delighted in friends who tell us the truth. Or look at 16.12. It says, It is an abomination for kings to commit wickedness, for a throne is established by righteousness. Wicked kings put themselves above the law. They are self-willed tyrants. And that is repugnant to the Lord. But, if they rule in righteousness, their government is established. When righteousness rules, government is established. Or look at 24, 23 through 26. It says, these things also belong to the wise. It is not good to show partiality in judgment. He who says to the wicked, you are righteous, him the people will curse. Nations will abhor him. But those who rebuke the wicked 
will have delight and a good blessing will come upon them. He who gives a right answer kisses the lips. The point here is judges, another form of a ruler, who says the wicked is righteous will be cursed by people and abhorred by the nations. But judges who rebuke the wicked and have the, will have the delight of the people and they will be blessed. Again, the characteristic that a wise ruler needs is righteousness. I think this applies to judges in court, politicians in public service, pastors in the pulpit, believers in the pew, and everybody in their private life. We all should seek righteousness. There's more, much more. 2026 says a wise king sifts out the wicked and brings the threshing wheel over them. To really appreciate that proverb, you need to understand the threshing wheel. In the ancient world, the threshing wheel passed over the grain to separate the grain from the chaff. So using the figure of a thrashing wheel, Solomon says the wise king separates the wicked from the righteous and punishes the wicked. Again, the idea is a wise ruler seeks righteousness. Or look at 25, 4 and 5. Take away the gross from silver and it will go to the silversmith for jewelry. Take away the wicked from before the king and his throne will be established in righteousness. Again, we're using a figure of speech. When silver is melted, the dross, the impurities, rise to the top. After the impurities are removed, the silver is suitable for jewelry. Likewise, when wicked counselors are removed from the king's court, the king's rule is established in righteousness. What is good for the ruler is good for citizens. This is a warning, it seems to me, from taking advice from the wrong people. But again, the issue is righteousness. Look at 31, 8, and 9. Lemuel's mother uh, says something to her son. Quote, Open your mouth for the speechless in the cause of all who are appointed to die. Open your mouth. Judge righteously and plead the cause of the poor and needy. Again, the king's mother, in this case, wants her son to be a righteous king when he's functioning as a judge. So she exhorts him to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves, especially people like the poor, those who are appointed to die, the needy. A righteous king uses his function as judge to be a helper and an advocate for the helpless. 28.12, for the righteous rejoice where there is great glory. And when the wicked arise, men hide themselves. When the righteous rise to power, when righteous leaders rule a nation, then there is joy. And the idea is that People rejoice when there is righteousness. When righteousness rules, there is glory. There is uh, elation. People are happy. And when wicked, the wicked rise to power, people hide themselves. They are discouraged. They are intimidated. They are fearful. They shrink and cower for fear. Thus, they try to escape the wicked one. But again... The word is righteousness. Look at 28, 28. When the wicked rise, men hide themselves. And when they perish, the government, the righteous, I'm sorry, increases. When wicked rise to the place of political power, people hide themselves for fear. But when the wicked politicians, rulers are overthrown or out of office, this proverb says righteousness increases they do not have to hide anymore. They don't hide. They thrive. Or look at 29.2. 2. 
When the righteous are in authority, people rejoice. But when the wicked man rules, the people groan. When the righteous rule, the people are happy. They are glad. They are secure. They're prosperous. And when the wicked come to power, there's widespread mourning. Now, I'm just rattling off one proverb after the other, but they all say basically the same thing. A wise ruler rules in righteousness. If I were going to sum up some of these, I would say the truth of Proverbs 28, 12, 28, 28, 29, 2 uh, result, uh, really result to this. That when the righteous rule, people are happy. They thrive. But when the wicked are in power, the people moan and groan and hide in fear. Simply put, character counts. When deciding which candidate to vote for, one of the things perhaps we should consider is that character should count. There's more on the subject of righteousness. 2914 says, the king who judges the poor with truth, his throne will be established forever. The throne will be secure. The king will judge righteously and that king will judge forever. Now, <laughs> you might apply that to an earthly king and he might go on for a long time. But you could take that one literally of the king of kings who will rule forever. Or look at Proverbs 31, 4 and 5. It is for kings, O Lemuel. It is for the kings to drink what? Not for the kings to drink wine, nor for princes intoxicating drinks, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert justice for all the afflicted. Simply put, wine is not for kings. If a king or a prince drinks to excess, he will forget the law and pervert justice. One commentator says, here afflicted refers to the whole class of poor people suffering humanity. Another calls it the downtrodden and the oppressed. So wine is not for rulers. It affects their judgment. There is a case many years ago of a woman who was wrongly condemned by a king. Uh, and she said rather boldly, uh, I appeal. It should be, the decision should be when you are sober. And that got her ruling reversed. Now, I don't know that we have many people who make decisions like that, but I don't doubt that it happens. There's more. We're still talking about the subject of righteousness. One more on that subject. 31.3. Do not give your strength to women, nor your ways to that which destroys kings. Now, the mother of the king is still talking to her son. And what she warns him about here is immorality. It drains the king's strength. It destroys the king and his kingdom. Matter of fact, this is another case where Moses said this exact thing. In Deuteronomy 17, 17, Moses said, Neither shall he multiply wives for himself, lest his heart turn away. Interesting. How many politicians have been derailed and destroyed? Because of immorality. But who's the greatest example of all? What great, great king got absolutely destroyed because of this? Answer, the author of this proverb. Now, actually, Solomon didn't write this, but it's in his book. Solomon is the great example of someone whose heart was turned because of women. To accommodate wives, Solomon began building pagan temples for them to burn incense and sacrifice to their gods. That's recorded in 1 Kings chapter 11. The scripture says, therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, 
Because you have done this and have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. Nevertheless, I will not do it in your day for the sake of your father, David. I will tear it out of the hand of your son. That is in 1 Kings chapter 11 also. We're told in Nehemiah chapter 13, did not Solomon king of Israel sin by these things? Yet among many nations there was no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, pagan women caused him to sin. That's in Nehemiah chapter 13. Now, I said there were five words I wanted you to remember. Know what the first one is? Ooh, somebody said it. Righteousness. Over and over and over again, the book of Proverbs, in one way or another, says a wise ruler rules in righteousness. The second word is truth. Listen to Proverbs 17, 7. Excellent speech is not becoming of a fool, much less lying lips to a prince. People expect consistency between what a person is and what a person says. Hence, excellent speech does not fit a fool. Some sense people expect honesty from rulers, lying is inappropriate to a ruler. So this verse talks about lying, and the point is a ruler should speak truth. Proverbs 20 verse 8 says, A king who sits on the throne of judgment scatters all uh, evil with his eyes. Again, it mentions evil, but what it's talking about is a judge having truth. And here the idea is when a king functions as a judge, he should sift out evil with his eyes. By carefully examining people, he can detect their motives and actions. And a wise king doing that is not easily fooled. Or look at 25 verses 1 and 2. These also are proverbs of Solomon and the men of Hezekiah, king of Judah, copied. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out a matter. Ooh, this is interesting. God sometimes hides things from us. Moses said the secret things belong to the Lord. Deuteronomy 29, 29. But here in contrast to the Lord who sometimes hides things, a wise king is said to search out the matter. He's looking for truth. God does not reveal everything, but makes proper decisions. In order for a king to do that, he must fully investigate the issue. In order to make good and wise decisions, all of us need to thoroughly research an issue before we make up our minds. Simply put, get the facts first. Search out a matter. Or Proverbs 29, 12, if a ruler pays attention to lies, all his servants will become wicked. I find this one particularly interesting. If a ruler takes the advice of liars, he encourages wickedness of the people around him. A wicked prince makes a wicked people. It all starts at the top. I will never forget that concept. Uh, years ago, when I lived in Dallas, there was an airline called Braniff Airline. Any of you remember Braniff Airline? It's out of business now. Well, they were notorious for not being a good airline. There were all kinds of things wrong. Every time you took a flight, you got aggravated at them. But in certain routes, it was the only flight you could take. And I remember uh, using them. I had to, to go to certain places as I was traveling as a speaker. And I remember a, a professor, a colleague of mine while I was uh, an adjunct professor, said the problem 
is at the top. And I don't think it had occurred to me. I thought it was just the ticket agent and the stewardesses and those kind of things. And he said, no, 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 no. This is at the top. And I think that's true. That what's at the top of an organization filters down through the organization. And that's what this proverb is saying. When a king is wicked and he's taking wicked advice from his counselors, then it permeates the whole organization. So, the second word I want you to remember of a wise ruler is truth. He gets an A. All right, there's two words so far. What was the first one? It's kind of weak. And the second is? Truth. truth. All right. You got to remember five words of a wise king. The third is mercy. Mercy and truth, according to Proverbs 20, 28, preserve the king, and by loving kindness, he upholds his throne. Now we're talking about mercy. A king who practices mercy and truth is preserved in his position, and the one who exercises loving kindness maintains his power. People respect rulers who are characterized by mercy as well as truth. They support those who are characterized by loving kindness. They do not respect tyrants. Mercy and truth are the brightest jewels in a royal crown. The ideal leader, ruler, unites wisdom and truth. Hear me and hear me well. This is critically important. Truth without mercy is rigid justice. Mercy without truth is undisciplined leniency. Someone has said a God of all mercy is a God unjust. Mercy must be righteous mercy. Righteousness must be merciful. Another has said justice must be tempered by clemency and clemency must be re strained by justice. What makes a father uh, be without mercy? But at the same time, a father is required to be firm and impartial. This is one of my favorite concepts in all the scripture, that there needs to be a blend of both mercy and justice. They need to be wedded together. So, a wise king is merciful. Now keep in mind, he's righteous and operates on truth, but at the same time, he's merciful. What a concept. Another proverb says something similar. He who loves purity of heart and has grace on his lips, the king will be his friend. Again, we're talking about mercy and grace People who have pure motives and speak with grace are the kinds of people wise kings want as their friend. So purity and graciousness are advantageous. advantageous. They give a person a friendship with leaders in high positions. All right, how are we doing? Got three words so far. Righteousness, truth, and mercy. mercy. What would be the fourth? The fourth word is wisdom. A wise ruler, a wise leader, a wise king has wisdom. Proverbs 8.15 says, now in Proverbs uh, 8, uh, wisdom is personified as a lady. So lady wisdom is speaking. And she says, by me, wisdom, kings reign and rulers decree justice. By me, princes rules and nobles, all the judges of the earth. So Lady Wisdom says that it is by her that kings reign and rulers dispense justice. When William McKinley took the oath of office as president of the United States, he prayed, quote, Give me now wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before the people that is so great. End of quote. 
Rulers who fall in love with and marry Lady Wisdom have children called righteousness. So add wisdom to the list. Another proverb that says the same thing is 1435. The king's favor is toward a wise servant, but his wrath against those who cause shame. A ruler deals favorably with a wise servant. Those who manage others deal favorably with wise servants, but managers get angry and explode at a servant who causes shame. Again, wisdom is the issue. 28.2 says, Because of the transgression of a land, many are its princes, but a man of understanding and knowledge, right will be prolonged. This passage is really talking about rebellion. It uses the word transgression, but the idea is rebellion. Where there is rebellion in the land, there are many rulers, meaning there are frequent changes in rulers. For example, in the northern kingdom, there were 20 kings in nine dynasties. Where there is a wise ruler, there is political stability. So again, the issue is wisdom. So far, I've given you four characteristics of a wise ruler. Righteousness, truth, mercy, and wisdom. One more. What would you imagine that might be? What other major virtues would a wise king have? And the answer is service. Listen to Proverbs 14, 28. In a multitude of people is a king's honor, but in the lack of people is the downfall of a prince. The glory of a ruler is the number of people he serves. The downfall is having too few supporters. True, this is true of uh, political leaders nationally, statewide, local political leaders And for that matter, the leader of any group of people, such as the elected leaders of the Homeowners Association, that in your position of leadership, you need to serve. And the greater the number you serve, the safer is your position. Proverbs 30, 29 through 31 says the same thing. There are three things which are majestic in pace. Yes, four which are stately in walk. A lion, which is mighty among the beast, does not turn away from any. A greyhound, a male goat also, and a king whose troops are with him. Now, in this case, the author is being very poetic and is simply saying, as the lion is strong and the greyhound is swift and the male goat is sure, So with the support of his army, the king is secure. So again, the idea is he is serving and they support him. Or 2816, a ruler who lacks understanding is a great oppressor. But he who hates covetousness will prolong his days. A ruler without wisdom seeks to enrich himself at all costs, trampling on others to get rich. He's not serving others, he's serving himself. But rulers who hate covetousness, according to this verse, have prolonged days, probably referring to their time in office. Someone has said a considerate ruler hating covetousness and living only for the good of his people will usually prolong his days. All right, you got those five words? Do you have them too tattooed in your brain? Just on the inside of your forehead, put them right there. So with the mind's eye, you see them every day. Here we go. What are they? Righteousness, truth, mercy, wisdom, and service. Now, let me ask you a question. Those words sound familiar. Let's get beyond the book of Proverbs. Let's get beyond kings, rulers, 
Those words sound familiar? I would like to submit to you that those are the great virtues of the Bible. I think you could almost reduce the Bible, at least the message of the Bible for us today, down to two basic things. God wants to give you the gift of eternal life when you trust Jesus Christ. Jesus is the son of God who died for you, who arose from the dead. And if you trust him, God gives you the gift of heaven, eternal life. And then God says, I want you to grow, to become Christ-like. Is that not what we're all about? Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing? Receive Christ by faith, trust him, and then grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does that look like? I wrote a book once on the spiritual life, and I wrote three chapters on just that. And after I wrote the book, I came up with material that could make a fourth. There's a lot in the New Testament on what is Christ like. But frankly, of all the things that you could say about being Christ like, at the top of the list would be righteousness, truth, mercy. Uh, what's the other one? I forgot it. Uh, wisdom and service. Told you to remember them and I forgot it. All right. But those are at the top of the list. Some of the greatest virtues in all of the Bible are righteousness and truth and mercy and wisdom and service. Jesus, for example, said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. That's just one example of many. John chapter 1 says Jesus is full of grace and truth. So this isn't just for kings. It's for all the citizens in the realm. It's for all believers who know Jesus Christ. It is what we ought to be about. That's why I want you to walk out of here with those five virtues. Now, that's the first point, and it's the longest. The others are relatively short. I said I had three points. The second one is I want to talk about the definitive essence of somebody having authority or power. The idea of being a ruler is someone who has, I could have listed this as one of the characteristics, only it isn't just wise kings, it, all people in authority. And it's the word power. All in authority have power. And there are several proverbs that highlight that. For example, 1615 says, in the light of the king's face is life. And his favor is like a cloud of the latter rain. Now, again, we're talking about something that happened in the ancient world, namely the latter rain. The latter rain came in March and April just before the harvest. And the clouds that brought the latter rain screened people from the scorching heat. So that's what this proverb is using as an illustration. So the point is, the king's favor is like that refreshing cloud. He possesses the power of being miserable, bringing misery, or happiness to people. He has the power to bring joy, like that cloud of refreshing, uh, refreshment to the people. Or 28.15 says, like a roaring lion and a charging bear is a wicked ruler over poor people. Now we're no longer talking about a wise king. We're talking about a wicked king. And he is like a selfish tyrant. He's intoxicated with power. He thinks there is no higher power. He fancies that people under his rule are made for him He's a brutal monster without principle and without heart. He pitied the poor under such rule. He roars at them like a roaring lion about to pounce on his prey. He is cruel. Again, the idea is he has power. So someone in authority, a ruler, a leader at any level has power to produce joy 
and roar and make people fear. Or Proverbs 16, 14 says, As messengers of death is the king's wrath, but a wise man will appraise it. This says it all. When the ruler is full of wrath, he punishes those with whom he is angry. But a wise man will appease the ruler's wrath. Or 20 verse 2 says, The wrath of a king is like the roaring of a lion. Whoever provokes him to anger sins against his own life. Those who provoke the hungry lion put their lives in danger. And those who provoke a king who is angry do the same. Or 1912 says, The king's wrath is like the roaring of a lion, but his favor is like the dew of the grass. The roar of the lion precedes its falling on its prey. Amos says in Amos 3.8, A lion has a roar who will not fear. So that when the king is full of wrath, he roars about to pounce on his prey. But there is a wise king who is, has favor like the dew on the grass. The dew on the grass is a picture of refreshment. The king's favor is gentle and refreshing. Ah. Now what I've done so far is say this. A wise king has five characteristics. But the essence, the very definition of being a king, a ruler, a leader at any level, is you have power. Now those are the two things that lead me to the third. The third thing is with all of that in mind, how do you deal with a king? Let me make several suggestions that come from Proverbs. The first is in 25.3. As the heavens for height and the earth for depth, so the heart of the king is unsearchable. The point of that proverb is no one knows exactly what a king is thinking. So from that, I'm going to draw a lesson. When you're around someone in authority, you don't know what they're thinking. Be careful. Look at Proverbs 23, 1 through 3. When you sit down to eat with a ruler, consider carefully what is before you and put a knife to your throat. If you are a man given to appetite, do not desire his delicacies, for they are deceptive food. Now, put a knife to your throat isn't talking about suicide. It's uh, restrain your appetite. And again, it's saying if you're in the presence of a king and you're having dinner, uh, be careful. Don't be a glutton. So the first lesson, given the fact that a, anybody in power has some degree of authority and power, be careful. Consider what you're doing. Another suggestion is don't exalt yourself. Proverbs 25, 6, and 7 says, Do not exalt yourself in the presence of the king, and do not stand in the place of the great, for it is better that he say to you, Come up here, than you should put, uh, be put lower in the presence of the, pre the prince whom your eyes have seen. So in the presence of the king, don't promote yourself or grab the place of honor. Because according to this proverb, it is better for the king to elevate you and not you be humiliated in the presence of a prince. So, don't exalt yourself. You ever heard that before? Where have you heard? Who taught that besides Solomon? How about Jesus? Listen to what he said in Luke 14. When you're invited by anyone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in the best place unless one more honorable of you be invited by him. And he who invited you and him comes to you and says, give place to this man. And then you begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place so that when he who invited you comes, he may say to you, friend, come up higher. 
when you have glory in the presence of those who sit in the table with you. For whosoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So Jesus taught, don't exalt yourself, even if you're going to a wedding. And Proverbs teaches that's particularly true if you're dealing with anybody in authority. They have power. So don't exalt yourself. There's another suggestion. Uh, excel in what you do. Don't concentrate on exalting yourself. Concentrate on excelling. Proverbs 22, 29 says, Do you see a man who excels in his work? He will stand before kings. He will not stand uh, before unknown men. Stand in this proverb probably is referring to serve. It probably includes the idea of being promoted to a place of honor. So the idea is um, uh, just do your best and let the king exalt you. Let him pick your place of service. Don't try to do it yourself. You just do your best in whatever capacity you have. Longfellow wrote a poem that said, The heights by great men reach and keep were obtained not by sudden flight, but they, while their companions sleep, were toiling upward in the night. I love it. You don't obtain it by sudden flight, but by toiling in the night. Just blossom where you're planted. Uh, exalt, not don't exalt yourself. Excel in what you do. One other piece of advice in dealing with those in authority. 2515 says, by long forbearance, a ruler is persuaded and a gentle tongue breaks a bone. Rulers here probably denote judges or a person occupying a high official position. The issue in this proverb is how to persuade someone in authority. When people feel that an injustice has been done, they are upset, angry, and they get passionate. Solomon says, it's long forbearance that will persuade someone in authority. Forbearance here includes anger. So long forbearance is being slow to get angry. Gentleness and patience will often persuade a prince more than a person becoming provoked and excited. Gentleness means just that, soft and gentle. A soft, gentle tongue is the opposite of a passionate, sharp, coarse one. A sharply spoken word can break a bone, this passage says. That is, do seemingly impossible things. It can accomplish difficult things. It can overcome obstacles. Or, as a German proverb says, patience breaks iron. And another proverb says, patience is stronger than a diamond. So the point is, a patient and gentle tongue will accomplish a lot more than temper and harsh words. Let me repeat that. Proverbs says, a patient and gentle tongue will accomplish far more than the loss of temper and harsh words. Interesting. Very interesting. Let me make a suggestion. The next time you speak to the service department about a complaint, you ever done that? You ever felt like you weren't treated right by a company and you went to complain? Well, I think this is a great piece of advice. The next time that happens to you, uh, you have a grievance, remember, in short, be tactful, be kind, 
Kindness is simply love flowing out in gentle words and helpful acts. If you want to win some, you must be winsome. I know somebody who is an absolute genius at this. It is my wife. If I ever have a complaint against a company or a business, I send her. She is absolutely brilliant at being gentle and walking away owning the company. So that's the way you handle people in authority. Now, we've covered a lot of ground today, and I did it rather rapidly, but it all boils down to this. Although a wise ruler is supposed to rule by righteousness and truth, mercy and wisdom and service, since they have power, regardless of who they are, you should deal with them by not exalting yourself, but by exalting your work. And speak softly. Speak gently. Is that good stuff or what? I started out saying, scratching my head, it says, this is to kings. How in the world am I going to apply that? And the answer is, there's application all over the place. Not only to be like a wise king, but to also know how to deal with someone in authority, wise, practical wisdom, straight from the pen of Solomon. Imar Dahan tells of the time when some took, someone took an issue with him on a matter which riled him up to the point that he wrote a fella a stinging red hot letter calling him very uncomplimentary names. He expressed a violent reaction that was, com was completely disarmed when a few days later he received a letter which read, Dear brother, thank you for your letter. Let brotherly love continue. Hebrews 13.1 Subsequently, they became the best of friends. As a result of that experience, Dahan suggested, quote, Meet every attack with kindness and a soft answer. Don't raise your voice when you feel like raising the roof. Raise your eyebrows instead. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us the wisdom of your word in this particular area. Now I pray the Spirit of God may indelibly impress it upon our hearts and minds that we may not only strive to be like a wise ruler, but we also may learn how to respond to those even when we feel like we've been treated unjustly. Lord, thank you for that kind of insight and wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen.